So today I'm going to try to t tell you what I think is the biggest problem in this whole story uh, of how we've gotten so fat and so sick so fast and why we can't seem to do anything about it. Uh, it's got a little bit of something for everybody, but we're going to really concentrate today on sort of linking the science to the policy. I will do my level best to keep the science at the absolute minimum, just enough so that the, the story will make sense. Okay, I have no disclosures, no food companies put me up to this. <laughs> Although if they want to slip me some money later. <laughs> All right, so I don't know how many of you saw this paper uh, that came out two months ago in Nature, which basically got the ball rolling. Uh, it has been um, vilified, attacked uh, m more times than I can possibly tell you. Uh, a uh, a five-page diatribe uh, it appeared in the Australian parliamentary record calling me an, the enemy of Australia um, <laughs> uh, shortly thereafter. Uh, you cannot believe what kind of firestorm this paper uh, generated. And uh, what I'm going to try to do today is sort of take this issue apart piece by piece and explain why it is that I think this is the problem, why my colleagues agree that this is the problem, and hopefully what we could do about it and who's standing in the way. Okay. First of all, the past. 2001, right? 11 years ago now. Six million kids are seriously overweight. Well, with all the media attention, with all the NIH money, with Michelle Obama's vegetable gardens, we are now at 20 million and continuing to rise. At present, there are 30% more obese than undernourished people worldwide. And 366 million diabetics walking the earth, 5% of the entire world's population, and they are chewing through all of the money. There is no money left. In 2024, Medicare will be broke, and it will be broke because of this. So, no health care for you, like the soup Nazi. <laughs> 100 million Americans will have diabetes by 2050. Okay. 165 million Americans obese by 2030. Bottom line, ain't going away. Nothing we can do, nothing we've been able to uh, mount has made any difference in terms of how this obesity epidemic has played out. No level of public education can fix this problem. In September, the UN General Assembly announced that non-communicable disease is now a bigger problem than acute infectious disease that includes HIV worldwide. That is a huge statement because that means that we have to marshal resources to now try to fix it. And they plan to target tobacco, alcohol, and diet. Well, tobacco and alcohol, well, we've been doing that for a while and it makes sense and we have some regulatory policies in place in virtually every country and we understand how to do that and what works. Diet. What the hell are we going to do about diet? Total calories, you know, we've been doing that now for how many years? 30 years? Eat less, exercise more? Hasn't worked? Not gonna. How about the fat? Well, you know, we did that too, and it only made things worse, and I'll show you why. Red meat, some people want that gone. Dairy, you know, the China study? We can talk about that later. Carbohydrate, I think this is the problem right here and I'll try to explain why I think this is the problem. This was in the New York Times Magazine a year ago, okay, it's called uh, Is Sugar Toxic? And ultimately I think that that is the important message to try to get across to policymakers. If it's about empty calories, it's a non-starter because you can get your empty calories from anywhere. You can get them from carrots or you can get them from cheesecake. But if they're sugar, it's something very different and very specific and potentially remediable and I'll show you why. So, in their book, Alcohol, No Ordinary Commodity, Thomas Baber and colleagues documented the four criteria for policy intervention, and they used alcohol as their example. Unavoidability, toxicity, abuse, and externalities, that is, negative detriments on society. And I'm going to take you through each of these four in order in terms of sugar and show you how sugar qualifies under each of these same guidelines. So let's start with unavoidability. All right, we're all eating more. No argument. Adult men are eating 187 calories a day more than 25 years ago. Adult females, 335 calories a day more. Teen boys, 275 calories more. We're all eating more. I don't argue that. 
What are we eating more of? Is it the fat? Nope, not the fat. Five grams, 45 calories. And here, if you look at the secular trends in specific food intake, whole milk, way down, red meat, it's about the same, cheese, other meats up slightly. Bottom line, it's a wash. And that's what the data says, it's a wash. Because we're not eating more fat. We were actually told to eat less fat. Remember, in the 1980s, okay, we were remanded from the AMA, the AHA, and the USDA to reduce our percent consumption of fat from 40% down to 30%. And guess what? We've done it. We're there. We're at 30% right now. And our obesity and metabolic syndrome prevalence has gone through the roof because it ain't the fat, and it never was. What we're eating more of, of course, is carbohydrate. 57 grams, 228 calories. Here's those carbohydrates on that same secular trend analysis, all right through the roof. That's what we're eating more of. And what carbohydrate in particular? Well, beverages. 41% increase in soft drinks, 35% increase in fruit drinks, fruit aids, etc. And of course, here in America, that stuff would happen to be called high fructose corn syrup, the most vilified food additive known to man. Everybody thinks this is the devil. I am here to tell you, no, it is not the devil. It is a devil. Okay? <laughs> and you're going to see why in a minute. Okay? Because the current annual U.S. consumption is 63 pounds per person per year. But notice, the only users of this right now are the U.S., Canada, Japan, and very limited exposure in parts of Europe. Yet, the entire rest of the world has just as much of a problem as we do. They're just a little bit shifted to the left on the curve, but their rate of acceleration is the same as ours, and they don't even have this stuff. So you can't say, oh, this is the bad guy. This is the Voldemort. This is the Darth Vader. <laughs> this is the Lady Macbeth, whatever you want to call it, okay? So what is this stuff? All right, so high fructose corn syrup is 42% or 55% fructose. Okay, here's fructose over here. Five-membered ring. This becomes very important when we talk about the toxicity. Here's glucose over here, six-membered ring. You'll notice they are not the same. And anybody who tells you a calorie is a calorie okay, is part of the problem, not part of the solution. Because a calorie is not a calorie. Because glucose and fructose are not the same. And it's this guy over here that's sweet. It's this guy over here that we seek. And it's this guy over here that causes the problems. And I'll show you why. But over here, down here, we have sucrose. Standard table sugar, cane sugar, beet sugar, the stuff you put in your coffee this morning. One glucose, one fructose. O-glycosidic linkage joining the two. The enzyme sucrase in your intestine cleaves this in about a nanosecond, and then you absorb the two monosaccharides. So basically, it's a wash in terms of what comes in, and it's also a wash in terms of the metabolic detriments. They are the same. All the data that pits high fructose corn syrup against sucrose looking at metabolic outcomes, show no difference. They are the same. They are equally bad. And I will show you why. So here's the secular trend of fructose consumption in our diet here in the US. Our ancestors getting fructose out of the ground from fruits and vegetables and the very occasional honey previously consumed on average about 15 grams a day. So double that for sugar, right? Because glucose weighs the same as fructose. So about an ounce a day is what it comes. Prior to World War II, with the advent of the nascent candy and soft drink industries in America, we got up to about 20 grams a day. By 1977, just before the glut of high fructose corn syrup hit our shores, we were up to 37 grams a day, and that was 8% of our total caloric intake. By 1994, we're up to 55 grams, or 10% of our total caloric intake. And now, adolescents are at 75 grams a day, or 12% of total caloric intake. That's mean. And 25% of adolescents are at 100 grams of fructose per day. Double that for sugar, that's 200, times 4.1 calories per gram, that's 840 calories in sugar. For a normal uh, caloric allotment of 2,000, that would mean 40% sugar in the diet. Now, the question is, what does it do to you? Can you handle that? Can your liver handle that? What are the negative downstream consequences of that sugar glut? This from right here from Yale. This is uh, Dr. Brownell's paper from Bartanian et al. 
meta-analysis of soft drinks and obesity, showing 88 cross-sectional longitudinal su su studies correlating energy intake, body weight, milk and calcium intake, and adequate nutrition against soft drink consumption, all showing significant effects. <clears throat> the disclaimer is that those studies that were funded by the beverage industry consistently demonstrated smaller effects than those that were not funded by the industry. Wonder why. How about taking the soft drinks out? So this is the Christchurch Fizzy Drink Study of James et al. in 2004. Here are the control schools continuing to rise in obesity because their soft drinks were not taken away. And here are the experimental schools, the intervention schools, and their prevalence has flatlined. They did, at least didn't get worse. They didn't get better, but they didn't get worse, at least suggesting that this might be valuable. All right, I want you to take a look at this. Here are a whole bunch of successful diets. Anybody in this room been on any of these? Anybody in this room still on one of these? It's very hard to stay on a diet, isn't it? For all sorts of reasons, okay? Choice, temptation, boredom, you know, hunger, you know, I mean, there's a whole bunch of reasons, access. But they all share two things in common. Every one of these diets has been successful in somebody or other, and they have two things in common. Do you know what they are? Low sugar, high fiber. Low sugar, high fiber. Every single diet that works does those. And you know what that's called? That's called real food. <laughs> real food. Eat real food. That's the only thing you have to remember from this lecture. Okay? You can all go home now, because that's it. <laughs> but that's where, that's the issue. Now how did we get this huge tsunami? Okay? This is the perfect storm that was set up by three political winds that swirled out of control all at the same time to basically create this tsunami. The first, back in 1973, Richard Nixon, recognizing appropriately that price instability of food causes political unrest. And if you don't believe me, all you have to go back is four years ago to when we decided to divert some of our corn crop to ethanol that caused rice riots in Thailand and ousted their prime minister. Now, he may have deserved to be ousted, but that's a different story. <laughs> Point is, Nixon knew that all fluctuating food prices caused political unrest, and he wanted to take food off the political table. And so he told his uh, agriculture secretary, Earl Rusty Butts, I love that name, <laughs> that food should never be an issue in a presidential election. Well, there's one way to do that, make food cheap. This is a map from Time Magazine last year of the percent of GDP spent on food by country. And here we are, 7%, the UK at 9%, and Australia at 11%, with the lowest percent GDPs, and we, of course, are the three fattest nations. Duh. But you'll also notice that all the countries in purple at 36 or greater percent GDP are all in revolution today. Indeed. For price instability, high price of food causes political unrest, indeed. The second political win, well, the advent of high fructose corn syrup. Invented in 1966 by Takasaki at Saga Medical School in Japan, introduced to the American market in, 19, in the early 1970s, and look what happened. So here's it. the U.S. producer price index for sugar. Up, down, up, down. You want this to be at 100% because that means price stability at 100%. Anything higher means things are going up, anything down, etc. Well, here's corn sweeteners coming in here, and look what happened. 100%. Look at that. Beautiful. And on the, London, uh, on the international stage, here's the London price doing the same thing. And, of course, the U.S. price being lower. And here's the U.S. retail price for refined sugar versus high fructose corn syrup. HFCS was half as much. Because it was half as much and now ubiquitous and readily available, it started appearing in everything. It started appearing in the hamburger buns. It started appearing in the hamburger meat. It started appearing in the barbecue sauce, the ketchup, the salad dressings, etc., etc. Today, soft drinks account for 33% of added sugar consumption. That means that 67% is elsewhere. It's throughout the rest of your diet. So Dr. Brownell and I had a nice discussion this morning about what if soft drinks just disappeared miraculously off the planet. Would that solve the problem? And I would pose to you that that would not solve the whole problem. We've got more to go. This shows 
the increase in high fructose corn syrup against the change in sugar. This is from the Corn Refiners Association themselves. And they said, well, it was just a substitution. I mean, this stuff is cheaper, so we use more of this and less of this. Well, not quite, because here's total. 73 pounds per year here, 95 pounds per year here. That's a 25% increase over that time. And there's something missing off this slide. Anybody know what it is? It's juice, right? Because juice is sucrose, right? And we know that the total juice servings per day correlates with the change in BMIZ score in inner city Harlem toddlers. Juice makes you fat. And the more juice, the more fat. And this shows it. So now let's add juice in here, now most fructose size. We're up to 130 pounds of sugar per year, each of us. That's six and a half ounces of sugar per day per person in America. And the question is, we used to consume one ounce. We now consume six and a half ounces. The question is, what does that do to you? That's where we're going.